now that we are at the top of the hour, I would like to officially welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar, which is uh, dedicated to the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. This webinar is an official European Commission's Green Week uh, partner event. That year, um, that this year, the Green Week has been entirely dedicated to water. I'm actually very glad that after last year's UN conference dedicated to water, also the Commission um, did the same thing. So that created a momentum and putting uh, at a highlight such a pressure resource, which is water. My name is Claudia Topalli, and I will be your host today. I'm Krista Majeska, a colleague of Claudia's. She seems to be having some connection issues. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, walk us through the rest of these housekeeping issues, and then we'll get started with the main event. Uh, on the left-hand side of your screen, under the video window, uh, you can see three icons, chat, Q&A, and handouts. The chat you can use to send a general comment or a message. And thank you for everyone who's begun with those messages, letting us know uh, about the uh, audio and what you're seeing. We also uh, would, are expecting a lot of questions. Please do type those in the Q&A tab. That'll help us make sure we get to as many as possible and keep them separate from the technical chat. If we don't get to all of your questions, which we might not, uh, we promise to follow up with you after the session directly. Many people have asked for a copy of the slides, and I'm happy to say that they are available. If you click the hands out, Handouts tab, you can download a copy of the slides at any point during the session. Also, closed captions are available. To turn them on, hover your mouse over the video window, select CC, and choose your preferred language. Finally, the session today is being recorded. And after the session, you will receive an email with a link to that recording. You will also receive an email with a certificate of completion for attending today. So now um, I will bring us along uh, unless Claudia is able to reconnect. I'll keep going. Uh, so what is so incredibly exciting about this is that we are talking today about the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. The directive aims to protect human health and the environment from the effects of untreated urban wastewater. It requires EU countries to ensure that towns, cities, and settlements properly connect and treat wastewater. It aims to protect the environment from the adverse effects of urban wastewater discharges and discharges from certain industrial sectors. To ensure that domestic and industrial wastewater is effectively collected, treated, and discharged. Today's session, focus specifically on two new articles that have been added to protect public health from a microbiological perspective. Article 17, urban wastewater surveillance is new and establishes a national urban wastewater monitoring system to monitor relevant public health parameters in urban wastewater. To that end, Member states will have to set a coordination structure between the authorities responsible for public health and urban wastewater treatment. This structure will determine which parameters will be monitored and the frequency and the method to be applied. Moreover, until the competent health authorities establish that the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic is not a risk to the population, the urban wastewaters from at least 70% of the national population will be monitored. Finally, for all agglomerations of 1,000, excuse me, 100,000 persons or more, member states will also have to regularly monitor antimicrobial resistance. <clears throat> In Article 18, a new article on risk assessment and management, by, which must be uh, in place by December 20. 31st of 2027, member states have the obligation to assess 
the risks caused by urban wastewater discharges to the environment and human health, and where necessary, to take additional measures on top of this directive's minimum requirements to address these risks. For what concerns microbiological connections, excuse me, for what concerns microbiological parameters relevant to public health and routine monitoring, the risk assessment needs to meet the requirement for receiving water. For example, if the water is discharged for a river used for drinking water, it has to include in the risk assessment the relevant parameters of the drinking water directive, such as E. coli, intracoxide, Legionella, et cetera. This agenda for, today's, for today includes these latest updates to the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive, the Risk Assessment Framework by Michel Sponar, a discussion of the reclaimed urban wastewater quality and microbiological monitoring by Nuno Broco, and microbiological requirements under the new directive by Brett Bruin. We will have a live Q&A session with all of our speakers towards the end of the session. Now, we are very, very fortunate today to have the deputy head of the unit at the European Commission, Michel Sponar. Michel Sponar has been working since December 2015 as the deputy head of unit at the European Commission, Directorate General for the Environment, dealing with the marine environment and water industry, and oversees the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. A very warm welcome to Michel. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay. Clear and loud. Okay, perfect. So um, I hope also that you have my slides. So good afternoon to everybody. My name is Michel Sponard. I'm here from DG Environment. And indeed, I was involved in the preparation and negotiation of the revision of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. This directive uh, is um, quite uh, old directive. It was adopted in 1991, and since 1991, it uh, has not been reviewed. So um, it was time for us to make uh, uh, this review, and the review is based on the uh, uh, evaluation of what has worked and not worked of this directive, and uh, we have published this evaluation in advance of uh, its review. And clearly, the lessons learned from this evaluation uh, are relatively clear this directive has delivered. It has delivered a lot uh, since 1991. The uh, improvement in the collection and treatment of wastewater was significant. It has driven uh, effective uh, and tangible, it has tangible in, uh, uh, impacts uh, that were visible. Uh, probably one of the reasons of this uh, uh, success stories is that this directive is quite simple. We are targeting collection and treatment of wastewater and there are requirements on monitoring and reporting, which are very clear and uh, simple to implement and simple to enforce. Also, the directive, uh, well, the Commission has uh, the, the possibility to have a kind of carrot and stick approach, carrot being structural funds, so European money, which was uh, given to the member states uh, to help them to build their infrastructure. But clearly, the stick is there as well. We, we had a, lo a lot of uh, infringement procedure to ensure that the member states are respecting uh, the deadline and the objective of this directive. One of the lessons of this evaluation was also that uh, uh, the benefits are uh, more important than the cost. Clearly, there were costs for the collection and for the infrastructure, and these costs are uh, significant. But at the end, the benefits for the environment and public health were uh, more important. Again, I'm not sure that you can try to find my slides. Um, clearly, from the lesson learned also, we have seen that there is room for improvement for this directive. and. Uh, Clearly, we have made a lot of efforts, but there is still some pollution coming from different sectors. I will come back on that. But um, also, eutrophication remains an issue in several uh, instances in the European Union. But this sector is also using a lot of energy, and uh, well, it's about 1% of the total energy uh, used or produced in the European Union, which is quite important and significant because uh, we can certainly do better. We thought also we have identified some issues also with the governance. Uh, um, this is a captive sector uh, where uh, citizens have no choice of their operator, and we have seen some issues with uh, governance and transparency, and the coherence uh, with the other legislation after adopted after 1991 
uh, is also a matter of uh, uh, importance because uh, there were several new legislation adopted after the urban wastewater treatment directive, which was one of the first pillars of the water policy in the European Union. Um, concerning remaining pollution, it's clear that uh, we uh, are tackling quite well the pollution coming from uh, cities uh, and going into a centralized uh, system. The remaining pollution that we try to calculate and which you will see in a slide, uh, you know, if not now, later, uh, are coming mainly from... Uh, uh, Michel, we uh, are in... seeing that, that your slide there um, is appearing to the viewers, the remaining pollution slide. I'm not sure why you're not ah, seeing okay. it, but others are seeing it. So, so uh, do just if you can say <laughs> next, um, we will advance the slides. I know it's difficult if you can't see, but we've got that slide with the remaining pollution as the header there now. Okay, super. Thanks a lot. So you can see that uh, you know, in fact, we have made a lot of efforts in this infrastructure, but then you know there are some sources that uh, were uh, not really tackled by the directive. Uh, the Pollution coming from small cities below 2,000, and, uh, 2000 inhabitants, uh, but also the pollution coming from stormwater and rainwater. In a sense, we, you know, we made these efforts, and then suddenly you have a few rains with uh, the, the and these rains are heavy, and the rain regime is changing in the European Union, and suddenly you have a mass of pollution which is bypassing the wastewater treatment plants and going directly to the environment. And that jeopardizes all the efforts made during the whole year when the severin is not there. We have also um, uh, remaining non-compliant load, even if the level of compliance with this directive is relatively high. And clearly, the standards which were adopted in 1991 are uh, outdated, notably for nitrogen and phosphorus. Last but not least, you have emerging uh, pollutants of emerging concerns. Uh, I don't want to speak too much about PFAS, but clearly we have uh, you know, an issue with pharmaceuticals uh, residues, which are now found in all our rivers and uh, lakes, in, uh, you know, not only in the European Union. So on the next slide, I hope it has passed. Um, we, I'm just summarizing what are the main measures which are in the revised directive. So the first is about uh, stormwater overflows and uh, urban runoff, where uh, we at European level are conscious that uh, there is no one single out uh, European solution. So what we are requiring now and requesting from the member states, but also from the cities in the member states, is to develop integrated management system in the cities which are taking uh, into account not only the quantities of water and the management of the quantities of the water, but also the quality of the water. And we are suggesting in the uh, revised directive that uh, a kind of hierarchy of action uh, should be considered, starting with preventive measures to avoid the dilution of uh, uh, dark water or uh, um, uh, well, wastewater with uh, rainwater, but also to, to uh, implement a green infrastructure to try to avoid that uh, clean water is going into the pipes. If it's not possible, then in the second row to try to uh, optimize the existing infrastructure, like uh, the reservoir, the network of reservoir in the cities, but uh, in connection with the wastewater treatment plant, so that at least the first flush and the most polluted uh, water are tracked in the system and sent to the wastewater treatment plants when the heavy rain has passed. And this and we have an indicative non-binding target of 2% maximum of the pollution there uh, in dry weather, so that uh, there is a reference to draft this integrated management plan. This is quite important. It remains uh, relatively flexible and the measure uh, should be adapted to each local situation. For small agglomeration and secondary treatment, we uh, know the revised directive imposes secondary treatment everywhere uh, as the minimum requirements for all the wastewater treatment plants in the European Union. And we have uh, extended the scope from 2,000 inhabitants to 1,000 inhabitants. That's something which will be the minimum requirements of the directive. There are some time derogation for going there, but uh, the objective is absolutely clear. And that's, uh, that's the integrated uh, with uh, some time derogation in the directive. For the individual system, which are still allowed, so if there is no economic or technical feasibility for a centralized system, individual systems are uh, allowed. But then we think that uh, um, this system should be improved. Their uh, design, their uh, maintenance, and their inspection should be more serious than today. In, well, it's serious in some countries, but not less in others. So we will uh, progressively move towards a standardization of the minimum requirements for this type of installation. 
on uh, nutrient and micropollutant, uh, we for nutrient rapidly we have reviewed the standards for nitrogen and phosphorus, but more importantly we have um, better defined what are the uh, area at risk for eutrophication. It's clear that since the adoption of the directive, we have uh, information coming from the water framework directive, but also from the marine strategy framework directive. And it's absolutely clear that uh, the information and data coming from these two directives are clearly designating some areas where there is an issue of eutrophication without doubt. And so we have included in an annex of this directive all these areas where we uh, where eutrophication is an issue today, meaning that in this area, there is no discussion anymore. Nitrogen and phosphorus should be treated, as well as for the big uh, big facilities above 150,000 inhabitants, where there is an understanding that these big facilities uh, should have a tertiary treatment without any discussion, whatever you know uh, are the uh, receiving uh, environment. Uh, that's more or less the same approach for micropollutant. We impose a, a treatment for micropollutant in the big uh, areas, big facilities above uh, 150,000 inhabitants, because we think that uh, the risk is established there. There is no discussion about the risk of, uh, of uh, this micropollutant in these big cities. But below 150,050 inhabitants, uh, the, uh, the approach is that uh, Quaternary treatment for micropollutant will be uh, will be required where there is a risk for the environment or public health. And there you have uh, two distinction in the text. The first is that obviously where there is uh, an intake of uh, drinking water uh, below in in the receiving waters and that there is a connection with drinking water, but we think that it's an area at risk. Also, where the dilution rate of the water uh, of the wastewater treatment plant is uh, is low, we think that uh, there is also a risk which is established. Uh, so there are some risks which are clearly identified in the directive, and then there are other risks which needs to be assessed by the member states uh, and their local authorities. Uh, the micropollutant uh, uh, treatment uh, cost would be covered and is expected to be covered by the pharmaceuticals and the cosmetic industry. According to our studies, these uh, two sectors are the main contributor to uh, micropollutant in urban wastewater. And so we have a system of producer responsibility where the bill, in fact, of uh, the treatment of uh, this micropollutant will be given to this industry and uh, they will have to organize themselves to make sure that this financing is happening. On the next slide, uh, it's um, uh, about energy and greenhouse gas emission. We think that we have to move towards uh, energy neutrality. And to do that, we uh, suggest to uh, impose progressively energy audits to all uh, facilities above a certain size. And so that will help to move towards a national objective of energy neutrality. Um, and also, we uh, require to have a better monitoring of greenhouse gas because it, it's the case for the big facilities, but not uh, enough for the uh, small or mid-sized facilities. So there we will help the member states to have a kind of a, uh, modeling and assessment of the greenhouse gas emission according to the different type of uh, facilities. And so that we have a better calculation of what are the greenhouse gas emission knowing that in the next step for the next revision, we will have to move towards also climate neutrality. On governance, there are different uh, uh, proposals. I will not go into the details. Apart from Article 17 on health, what we saw uh, during the COVID crisis is that, uh, in fact, uh, the virus was present in wastewater even before uh, the pandemic starts. And so it was a very precious information. We, you can really track the presence of this virus. Uh, you could uh, track it, you know, uh, uh, you, I, I think that we have seen some example of uh, one month before the actual pandemic, it was already present in the wastewater. And it's an information which could have been fundamental for our preparedness uh, for this uh, pandemic. And uh, after when the pandemic was there, it was clear that we could track this uh, virus into the wastewater treatment plant to understand precisely where the pandemic uh, is happening and to track where uh, it has decreased or increased. And also uh, it would have been a, a good indicator, a good tool to be used by the health authorities to manage the pandemic when it's there. So at the same time, we could use it as a preventive uh, uh, tool, but also as a curative tool when the pandemic is there. So now in the directive, we uh, push for a mandatory uh, monitoring of se several health parameters, 
it was a discussion with the council and the parliament that at the end, uh, the, the compromise is that the health authority together with the environmental authorities of each country has to um, identify the uh, health pa relevant parameters to be monitored in the wastewater and then they have to put in place the, the monitoring. But in case of pandemic, the, the monitoring is compulsory for the health re relevant uh, parameters. Uh, and also, we, the, the, it is compulsory, it will be compulsory to monitor antimicrobial resistance, which is really a problem which is identified at what level. And so we think that we need more information and data so that we can adapt the strategy to fight uh, uh, AMR in the future. Um, coming to uh, the risk assessment, we have uh, an additional article, which is Article 18 which is a, a classical article that we've introduced in several Euro environmental legislation. So member states um, are supposed to implement all these measures. So to, for instance, to expand the, uh, the scope to 1,000 inhabitants, so passing from 2,000 to 1,000, to increase and to, to improve the nitrogen and phosphorus standards, etc., etc. But in some area, that would not be enough because uh, to reach notably the objective of the water framework directive or other directive, or for instance of the baiting water directive where you have better and you could have uh, microbiological uh, uh, contamination if there is no disinfection in the wastewater treatment plants. So we are uh, requesting to the member states to make a risk assessment, uh, you know, of uh, the uh, of the, um, the areas where there is discharge of wastewater and to identify where relevant additional uh, risk, potential risk, and the rhythm for making this assessment is completely uh, conform and aligned with the river basin management program of, under the water framework directive so that we, we have tried to limit administrative burden as much as we can and to have a kind of uh, consistency with the water framework directive. And in case there is a risk, a remaining risk for the environment or public health, to take additional measures which are be, uh, above these minimum requirements of this directive. So, and that could, you know, concern a lot of uh, uh, different action. Well, obviously there is a list of actions to be considered in the directive, uh, which are all related to the fact that the threshold are simply, uh, you know, the threshold, the minimum threshold and the minimum requirements are uh, passed by additional measure. Um, starting with preventive measures to limit pollution at source, that's absolutely clear. I'm nearly there. The, uh, just briefly, we have calculated, obviously, the cost and the benefits of this uh, proposal. We arrived to the conclusion that the benefits are uh, above uh, double of uh, the cost of this directive. The costs are not negligible. It's about uh, 4 billion euros per year when this directive will produce all these effects. I mean, included so by 2045, so it's a progressive increase of, uh, of the cost. Um, and by 2045, it includes uh, the uh, CAPEX and OPEX, and we made, uh, um, you know, an in-depth assessment of the cost, and I think the uh, assessment of the cost is relatively solid. On the benefit side, it's based on different studies, which are difficult to sometimes to interpret, including willingness to pay, but also uh, we have some data and some figures for uh, the benefits of reducing one ton of nitrogen, one ton of uh, BOD in the environment. These figures are uh, relatively well accepted in the economic community. Well, this uh, additional cost will be covered by three main sources. Uh, clearly, water tariff, and water tariff uh, usually are absorbing 70% of the cost today. Um, by public budget and also including European money, which covers 30% uh, of the uh, budget today uh, on average. Huh? There are large difference between the member states. In the future, this uh, share will change a little bit because we'll have this producer responsibility scheme where uh, pharmaceutical and cosmetic industry will contribute for the uh, micropollutant treatment, which represents uh, about a third of the, pro of the cost of the project. Um, when it comes to the impact, uh, well, you can see from this slide that uh, uh, on the different uh, pollutants, the pollution will decrease. We arrive to the limit of the maximum feasible scenario. It's in between a maximum feasible scenario and a scenario uh, that we have chosen now. Uh, we are expecting a reduction of microplastic release, mainly through uh, better stormwater uh, overflow management. And with energy neutrality, we are expecting a reduction of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission by nearly 48%. So 
So my last slide is just to tell you that uh, uh, this directive has been uh, now um, in approved with a final text which was approved by the Parliament and the Council in trilogue. So now we are working these days with the jurist linguist uh, of the institution to make sure that the text is uh, crystal clear for everybody. And when this work will be done, it will be in the coming uh, days or uh, weeks, then we will send back the final text to the Parliament and the Council, the new Parliament and the Council, for the final adoption. But it's uh, in principle, it's just a procedural step that we need to do. Uh, the, the, the text, the compromise, political compromise and the previous text was endorsed by the Council and the Parliament in, the, in a trilogue. So these texts are uh, secure. Now it's simply a few logistic corrections that we are introducing in the text to uh, finalize it and to make sure that everybody has a same interpretation when it will be adopted in October, November, and then published uh, uh, 20 days after. And then, <coughs> pardon, member states will have 30 months for the transposition. In parallel, we are already working at commission level on the different, uh, to prepare the different implementing and delegated act. We have a 12th, uh, around 12 implementing delegated act to produce in uh, two to four years. Uh, it concerns methodology for measuring different things like PFAS, like AMR, uh, so like microplastics, but also uh, implementing act and delegated act on uh, the design of the individual system, for instance, or uh, alternative indicator for stormwater overflow. So there is a long list of things that we have to do. And in parallel, we uh, are also working on uh, an exchange of organizing an exchange of best practice on the implementation of the producer responsibility scheme where we have uh, seen during the negotiation that the water authorities are less familiar with uh, producer responsibility schemes than their colleagues of uh, waste, because in the waste sector, it's uh, quite well developed. And so we intend to uh, support the member states in the implementation of these uh, producer responsibility schemes, which is relatively new in the water sector. And that, that's it. I hope that you have seen my slide and sorry for the confusion. <laughs> well, apologies on our part. I. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Uh, the rest of us were able to see your slides. So thank you. Do rest assured they were excellent slides. And I am just um, so uh, I'm appreciative of all the in-depth work that the commission is doing. There is, this is a very rich and very important uh, piece of work. And uh, all the steps that are currently in progress and will be coming forward are going to be so valuable uh, throughout the community. Uh, so thank you very much. We will be bringing you back uh, for the live question and answer section of the uh, webinar after we have a, hear, have a chance to hear from Nuno and from uh, Brett. So thank you again. Yeah. Our next presenter is Nuno Broco and Nuno has more than 25 years of experience in private and public company management and is currently the executive chairman of Aguas do Terra Atlantico, and he will correct the pronunciation for me. Thank you for your patience. The EDP Group's largest company on wastewater management. He is also the vice president of Water Europe. And previously, uh, Nuno was chairman of EDP Valor, the EDP Group company responsible for fostering innovation digital translation, transitions, and the circular economy within the ADP group. Thank you so much. We're delighted to have you with us today. And I know our audience is eager to hear from you, Nuno. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I tried to bring um, our vision as utility. And uh, for that, it's important to explain who we are. I'm part of the uh, Agos Portugal group. Uh, we are a group of uh, utilities. We operate only on, in Portugal, uh, uh, and we supply service to around 8 million of inhabitants in, in Portugal. And um, we have different operational companies spread all over the country. Some of those companies work only on, on potable water. Some of, those, of them work on, on uh, wastewater, like my company. and. Uh, there are also companies that work with both sides of the, the cycle. And uh, we treat uh, every year around 600 million cubic meters of water. And I call your attention for 
the figures that I have in this slide, mainly the safe water supplied in, in my country, that is 99.7%, uh, and this is um, a very important number, and we are very proud of, of that. And I will talk a little bit more about how we have achieved this in the last, um, in the last years. In my company, uh, we really uh, believe in, in this uh, one water vision. Um, we manage uh, water, uh, single water, we manage potable and uh, wastewater, but at the end, it's only one water. And um, uh, we, in, in my company, we have been uh, working on uh, water safety plans for a uh, long time, at least uh, uh, since 2009. And uh, we do, uh, we carry out this hazard analysis and risk assessment in a systematic way, um, mainly on the, on the potable water side. And since 2020, with the new wastewater uh, reuse framework uh, from the European Union, and also uh, with our national legislation regarding the, the, the the way that we can get the permits to, to reuse our wastewater, we are also doing this um, doing this uh, um, analysis, uh, uh, risk analysis for wastewater. So uh, we believe uh, that uh, for some reason, okay, now I can see it again. Uh, we we believe that uh, due to the centrality of uh, the water cycle in our lives we uh, need to go for a full cycle risk analysis um, more than do it only in one side of the, the cycle. So uh, regarding water safety plans, we are using the um, methodology that has been devised some 20 years ago by uh, WHO and IWA. Um, and the core uh, of this work uh, is indeed the risk assessment, the identification of hazards, and the establishment of uh, control measures. We have been done this, like I told you before, for 15 years, but we feel that we need to integrate water safety plants and sanitation safety plants. So when we uh, work on, on the potable water side, of course, we look for the use of the water that we, uh, at, the, at the end, it's for potable uses, of, of course, but we also look from the perspective of the receivers of those, um, of, of that water. Uh, we look for the water resources. And telling this, I think that is very clear for everyone that we cannot do this, uh, this uh, work on the potable water side without do it in uh, also in the um, urban wastewater uh, part. And um, this is uh, something that the new directive uh, brings as new, and we really believe that we, this will close a gap that we feel until now regarding this, this risk assessment. So, we have started some years ago to test also the sanitation uh, safety plans in our companies. Um, the methodology has, is very, very close from, uh, from, from that one that is used uh, for water safety plants. And we really believe that uh, in this moment, the Article 18 of the new um, directive will, uh, uh, will be um, will be uh, very uh, aligned with with what we have uh, been doing for the last years uh, at a pilot level in our wastewater um, uh, activity and also with what we have done during the last uh, years on reusing the wastewater. Very important to do that is something that the new directive also in, uh, included. On the Annex 5 of the Urban Wastewater Directive revision, we can find the integrated discharge management plans. And this is, from our perspective, 
a very important and a very um, uh, a very uh, demanding uh, uh, question that we have felt um, that was needed for some for some years. And uh, this uh, new uh, tool will uh, put around the table the different stakeholders that manage water in a city or in a in a certain place. Uh, this I, I, I really believe that that this uh, new device, this, this new tool, will increase the, 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 the our, our our the quality of our mission in terms of water quality, public health, of course, environmental sustainability, and operational efficiency. And uh, with that, and for the implementation of this um, integrated charge management plan, um, I'm sure that we will need, and I heard from Michael, uh, we need to have some increase in, in, in our treatment. The stormwater uh, will be uh, one of the major, major um, uh, uh, points that we will be working in this, in this uh, integrated charge management plan. What, what water reuse will be, um, uh, from our perspective, will be um, uh, one of the points that could be working this, in this uh, topic. And of course, um, we will have uh, a reduction of the quantity of water that we have uh, available. So this is connected with wastewater um, reuse. I bring, you, um, I bring you an example about what we are doing. And this can raise some of the questions that I would like to put on the table for um, discussion. Um, we have been, uh, since 2022, reusing uh, wastewater in uh, one of the most noble places in, in my, my city, in Lisbon. This is a, a very green area of, of Lisbon, a very expensive area of Lisbon. And it was also one of the first permits for reusing uh, uh, wastewater that we had in Portugal. This was um uh, this, this permit this permit was issued by our national authority environmental authority and the risk assessment that has been made uh, for one and a half year it was very demanding because it was one of the first so we couldn't fail at the moment and we also decided to go for class a um a reutilization uh, quality so for for that we have made a risk assessment, a very detailed risk assessment uh, process. We have defined um, important, uh, very strict criteria for risk evaluation uh, by the, the both the producer and the, the user of this um, um, water, and we have implemented a set of control measures to uh, avoid any uh, issues regarding public health or even for water bodies that at the end receives the reused wastewater. Currently, we are monitoring the quality of, the, um, of this uh, reused wastewater with um, uh, very common uh, parameters, BOD, COD, phosphorus, nitrogen, and also from biological um, uh, side with E. coli and the intestinal parasite tax. After the revision of the directive, and since this is uh, one of uh, the largest points that we have um, uh, in our system, we uh, believe that beside those um, uh, parameters, we need also to go for uh, virus and uh, emerging pathogen, pathogens and also uh, species that are resistant to um, uh, antibiotics. And uh, during the pandemic situation, we have uh, participated in uh, some research project with this uh, plant. So for two years, we have been monitoring some of those uh, parameters that will be uh, required after the, the revision of the directive. And we have some experience already doing that. We have done this in, a, like I told you before, in a research project, so um, we found uh, the, we have uh, looked for the levels of SARS-CoV, other virus, uh, human and non-human virus, 
um, and a set of uh, genes that confers resistance to to uh, anti micro um, to antibiotics. But this was under a research project, and I think that this can bring us an important number of questions that should be answered before before go to um, to uh, the implementation at full scale of this um, of this uh, new way to look for our wastewaters. Uh, according to the analysis that we have made to the what is already known from the directive, we have estimated that um, we will need to double the sampling frequency of uh, our wastewater with uh, with uh, under under 150,000 people, and uh, for bigger than that we uh, are estimating that uh, the sample effect frequency will increase by uh, 400%. And we have to end this, uh, some emerging pollens like we have discussed uh, before. So this will bring us to uh, important investments, not only from uh, sampling uh, point of view, but also from detection point of view. Of course, we need to integrate here new technologies this will be important because uh, a new methods will be um, needed. Of course, we must look for our teams, and it's very important to know and to be more uh, uh, aware about the method methods that will be uh, used for this kind of detection. And um, we have made an estimation, of course. Uh, Michael uh, has present big numbers. Uh, we try to make an estimation of the, the cost of uh, monitoring the quality of the product that we that we release in the environment. And uh, today, uh, depending on the uh, size of the wastewater treatment plant, we have a cost of uh, analytic control, control between 1% of the total tariff and 5% of the total tariff. This depends, of course, on the size, on the environmental uh, framework that where the plant is integrated and so on. And according to our estimation, and I should note that this is a raw estimation, we estimate that this can double uh, at the maximum um, uh, with the new uh, directive uh, obligations. So with this, I think that we should be aware that um, we need to have clear scenarios about the new monitoring methodologies that we need for those parameters. We, need, we know that we should develop uh, new analytic methods because at the end this goes uh, this uh, additional costs go to the citizen uh, pocket. We need to work on automation of those methods very important um, data management and uh, our staff uh, skills are also important to look look at and to increase it when 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 it justifies and also we know that we as utilities we cannot do everything alone we need to establish partnerships we need the market we need to also um, work with the uh, partners um, for this uh, increased amount of, of, um, of monitoring. For conclusion, of course, um, we know that people are the heart of the progress, and um, we know that today uh, water is much more um, than environment. Uh, indeed, I hope that not uh, this revision of the directive, but, but maybe in the next one, we will have only uh, one directive for pot for potable water and wastewater. And um, today, with these new requirements of the directive, we are looking for global health, we are looking for economy, we are looking for food and energy security, but also for climate change mitigation and, and adaptation. And for that, and in such a holistic panorama, we need to make this risk assessment and risk management, and we fully agree with the introduction of that in the, the new directive. Of course, um, this will bring additional costs to our community, 
and it's important um, for uh, people understand that today water service is much more than protect the environment. So I will give as uh, I will uh, put on the table was as last um, two ideas. Um, we need um, to communicate the reason why we are increasing the tariffs to our citizens, but also uh, increase the communication capacity that we have with our communities in order to show that we are doing much more than, than, than protect the environment and uh, the citizen, the common citizen need to understand um, what is paying for and uh, this is a challenge that the water sector has um, putting more data, more information uh, for citizen using. And uh, that's it from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nuno. It is incredibly important to be able to hear how this directive may play out in the field and even much more so to hear from the perspective of a leader in so many of these aspects, uh, such as Agua de Portugal. So very much appreciate your bringing us to, from the theory to the practice and how these things may move forward and your perspective on, uh, on the one water concept. Thank you. And we look forward to having you uh, for the live questions uh, at the end of this. I'm now going to move us and introduce our next presenter, uh, Dr. Brett Bruin, uh, who has been working in the field of water of microbiology for over two decades and has over 20 years experience in the analysis of water for the presence of waterborne pathogens. He has worked closely with laboratories and experts developing new technologies, training analysts, and establishing best practices in order to optimize complex technical procedures and generate re robust me methodologies, including working with standards organizations around the world. Welcome, Brett, and thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you for taking time out of your day to join us today. Also, thank you for Michelle and Nuno. Uh, I think a lot of what you said is going to be relevant also to, to this brief presentation, which I'll give. I'll <clears throat> briefly cover um, the description of urban wastewater, uh, and we'll dig a little deeper into microbial analytical parameters with regards to the urban wastewater directive. Uh, and then we'll just do some little brainstorming on what else we might want to consider in the future. So this is directly from the Urban Wastewater Directive. Uh, water is a primary good which belongs to everyone. Uh, it's a natural resource that is essential and indispensable to life. And it needs to be considered in social, economic and environmental dimensions. Um, absolutely agree 100% uh, with all of that. With regards to urban wastewater, this could be <clears throat> domestic wastewater, could be non-domestic wastewater, it could be urban runoff, or it could be a mixture of all those three water types. So it's quite a complex matrix um, in essence. Now, if you look at Article 17 of the Urban Wastewater Directive, uh, it points out some of the minimum requirements for monitoring. Uh, Article 17 um, concerns uh, health related uh, parameters that we might want to consider. Uh, we've already heard antimicrobial resistance is becoming uh, increasingly important, so monitoring for that in wastewater is becoming uh, an increasing matter. And then there's individual pathogens that we're looking for. So we've heard SARS-CoV-2, polio virus, influenza virus. <clears throat> then it gets uh, a little bit more complicated because it also mentions uh, testing for emerging pathogens and any other parameters considered relevant. Um, and for me, that's quite difficult to, to interpret without some further, further guidance. If we look at a couple of other directives and what they might prescribe, um, we might get some idea of, of what is considered important in terms of urban wastewater, but also um, the treatment directives. 
So if we look at the EU drinking water directive, we've got some uh, microbiological parameters, uh, Entrococci and Escherichia-Coli, and we've got uh, absolute limit values for those parameters per unit volume. In addition to that, we've got some indicator parameters. So indicator parameters are probably not a direct risk to public health, but they are good indicators of water quality. So here we're looking at total coliforms. Uh, and again, we have a limit value per unit volume uh, and also looking at uh, total counts. Uh, and again, looking at no significant change in those total counts. It's a general measure of water quality. And then in some certain cases where we're doing, for example, risk assessments of domestic systems, uh, we have a requirement to look for Legionella. And again, we've got limits per unit volume. I, I really like the way this is set out in the EU drinking water because it says to a utility or a treatment facility, you need to look for these parameters. These are the values. And therefore, those analysts and operators know when these limits are breached, they know what actions to take to remedy the situation. So it's very clear um, what has to be done for drinking water. Similarly with bathing water, so this covers um, both fresh inland waters and marine coastal waters. And we have two parameters uh, for both of these, the Entrococci and Escherichia coli. And again, we have limits on what we would consider excellent, good and sufficient quality of that water. It's very clear, it's very precise. Operators and analysts know what they need to test for and uh, the limits that are acceptable. A really important consideration is routine monitoring. Regardless of the water type, it could be drinking water, bottled water, wastewater, sewage sludge. Uh, we have to perform routine monitoring of that water. We need to look, in particular in terms of treatment, is um, what is the suitability of that treatment methodology and what is the efficacy of that treatment methodology. Ultimately, to answer the question, are levels of contamination acceptable for an intended use, whether it's drinking, whether it's bathing? So typically, we would use indicator organisms um, to give us uh, some accurate numbers on that. The indicator organisms act as a surrogate for our pathogens. They're far, far easier to detect than many, many pathogens out there. They provide evidence of faecal contamination and therefore the potential risk of that water containing other disease causing bacteria and viruses and therefore a potential risk of a disease associated with that particular water type. So what other things should we consider? <clears throat> it really, really very much depends. And we've heard this from Michelle and also um, in the previous presentation, it really depends on the usage and application for that water type. And it should be decided based on a suitable risk assessment. Just some examples of what we might want to consider. Other bacteria, E. coli, Entrococci, Legionella, Protozoa, Cryptosporidium, Acanthamoeba. You could think of a scenario where a particular uh, where urban wastewater is collected and treated and then it's going to be used, for example, in an agricultural application. If they're using uh, an irrigation method where aerosolization is involved, they would absolutely want to consider Legionella. So it's quite important to consider these other parameters. So if we just take those one by one, eco -like. Um, to doubt, um, you should be testing water for E. coli from when it comes into a treatment plant to when it exits a treatment plant, uh, when it's stored before it's used. It's the World Health Organization's preferred indicator of fecal contamination. It's present in greater than 95% of animal fecal matter. It's very, very simple to test for with existing proven technologies. Also, Entrococci. They tend to be more resistant to chlorination than E. coli. Um, they can survive longer in the, in the environment. And so when 
water is stored, it may be a useful indicator for water holding time. And then Legionella, um, as we've discussed, anytime there's aerosolization involved, aerosolization involved uh, in an application, Legionella should be considered. Obviously, there's a significant risk of Legionnaire's disease associated with Legionella pneumophila when aerosolization is involved. Looking at the two protozoal examples, Cryptosporidium highly resistant to standard water treatments. Um, we've had an outbreak recently in the southwest of the United Kingdom associated with Cryptosporidium. Causes severe gastrointestinal illness and it can be associated with greater than 30% of soil and vegetable samples. So again, if the intended usage might be agriculture, we might want to be considering Cryptosporidium. Acanthamoeba, opportunistic pathogen, often associated with water and soil, and so uh, runoff also into rivers and lakes, potentially again a risk when aerosolization is involved. Just as a summary, you know, the current uh, wastewater treatment directive, particularly when it comes to public health, is focusing primarily on pathogens rather than indicators. Um, it does suggest that we should consider any other relevant parameters, but I think the wording around those parameters is a little bit vague at the moment and a little bit confusing for utilities for treatment plants. Um, I think it should be specified which organisms, particularly indicator organisms, uh, should be used. They're simple to monitor. And the use of indicator organisms provides an indication of the potential presence of other disease causing organisms, which are an issue to public health. But they also provide an indication of the efficacy of the water treatment applied. And with that, I thank you. Thank you so much, Brett. I hope you can hear me now. Uh, I would like also to thank Christine for um, for um, stepping in and uh, covering that technical issue in the beginning. Uh, Christine is our global director for government affairs in water. Um, I would like to thank all our speakers and also conscious of times. I have a couple of questions. I would uh, um, start actually with Michelle if he's uh, connected. Yes, sure, I'm there. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for the update on the urban wastewater treatment directive, as Christian was uh, mentioning. This is very, very um, valuable to all our audience and ourselves as well. You mentioned that uh, Article 17 and 18 uh, that are very relevant to public health and um, what we have seen also across the rest of the presentations, it seems that there is need for some more clarification uh, on how special users are going to perform the risk assessment. So it's going to be a European guidance um, or the member states should think about uh, providing a specific guidance to the utilities and the water treaters. And if there is going to be a European guidance, is there, does the Commission has in mind a, a deadline so that to help the, um, the member states and the users uh, comply with, uh, with the requirements? Thank you. Uh, for, as for all directive, we have an expert group following the implementation of the wastewater treatment directive type of uh, uh, things will be discussed with the experts of the member states and with the stakeholder. And if there is a need for uh, more guidance on Article 17 and 18, we will uh, certainly consider it. It's not yet foreseen in the directive, contrary to other articles, huh? but we could certainly envisage the need which is expressed by the member states and by the, their experts. But having that said, we, can, we will certainly organize an exchange of best practice and compare a little bit how the member states are doing this uh, risk assessment, uh, but also um, the health parameters that were identified in Article 17 by each country. And then probably on that basis, in this comparison and in bench, we, 
will uh, see whether uh, guidance would be uh, required, useful, and provide an added value. I must say that myself, guidance documents, uh, I we have um, of it where we could pass a long time of developing this guidance document, which at the end are not used by the member states. So because they are not legally binding. So our mm -hmm. limited resource, we are focusing our time and uh, you know energy on what is legally binding, meaning the implementing and delegated act. But clearly, if there is a demand, uh, they do it. And really, uh, the exchange of best practice seems to be a good way forward as well, at least to, to start. I hope I have answered to your question. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I'll be looking forward also to the next meeting as well of the expert group of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive, which I've heard it hasn't been so recent, but uh, with uh, the adoption and uh, the formal adoption of the directive, I'm sure that there's going to be a, a meeting set up. Um, I would like actually, <clears throat> um, I have some other questions for you. Apologize. <clears throat> but I would like to ask also Nuno if he's connected uh, and um, and thanking him again also despite the technical difficulties uh, for the great overview that he gave on uh, Aguas de Tejo Atlantico of the group Aguas de Portugal. So they're serving like almost uh, the total population of Portugal and they're making sure that uh, their work is contributing to protect the public health. Um, you do um, currently monitor a number of microbiological parameters to comply with current requirements. What do you think you would need as mostly as a support to make sure that also the, the requirements in, uh, in Article 18 as well as in Article 17 are, um, are met? Okay, thank you for your question. Um, well, um, following uh, Michael, uh, Michael's speech and answer that he gave uh, just now, um, I think that in, in the first moment, each country should have this uh, assessment in order to clarify what uh, is under uh, the utilities responsibility. Because the directive uh, clearly states that um, the, the public health uh, indicators, um, the monitoring of the public health indicators should be performed by the member state. But it's not clear if this is under, uh, totally under the responsibility of the utilities, because we have, of course, utilities, but we have health authorities also, and we know during these last uh, three years that we have tried to put them together, the environmental and the health authorities and this was a challenge so uh, each uh, member state should have uh, a clear definition about what remains under the responsibility of each one so this is the first point the second point that i think that is also very important in order to um, put this this uh, monitoring running as a, as a, as a full <coughs> scale uh, is the methods that will be recognized as available uh, methods to um, quantify these uh, different species and, and uh, pollutants. Because, uh, like I told you before, we have been working in this research project, monitoring a set of uh, new species and also SARS-CoV, and uh, every day was uh, emerging new methods, uh, of course, with a common base, but now utilities should have this clarification about what will be the methods that to, we need to use for this monitoring. And uh, in this, at this level, I think that um, European Commission could have an important uh, job because at the end we need to compare data and uh, I don't believe that Portugal should do different from Spain or Spain different from France. So we need to have a common base, we need to have a uh, um, uh, only uh, one or two methods that can be comparable and then we can com compare that. Finally, and big challenge, uh, I think that risk assessment cannot be done without having all the stakeholders around the table. And this has been a challenge for a long time, you know that, and uh, people from utilities, people from agriculture, uh, 
people from the, the those that manage the cities, they need to sit together and to make this uh, risk analysis. And I, I'm very, uh, I hope that this uh, really works, what is foreseen in the, in the directive, because this will be a huge uh, step to increase our resilience. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much um, uh, for, for that, Nuno. Um, conscious of the time, I also would like to thank um, as well Brett for really this uh, enlightening presentation. Actually, every time I talk to Brett, I learn something. Uh, since my boss is online, I'm not going to tell what I learned to you today, but I'll pick a question for him uh, from the chat where they say that um, um, what um, what indicators do you have in mind, Brett, that could represent the risk? The, the number one parameter that I would always specify would be E. coli for, for three reasons. Firstly, it's simple to test for with existing proven technologies. Secondly, um, it provides an indication of the risk of faecal contamination and therefore the potential for the presence of disease causing organisms and therefore the potential for a real risk of disease. Um, the final uh, reason for testing for E. coli is it gives you good quality data on the suitability and the efficacy of the treatment that's being applied to a particular water type. Thank you. Thanks Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking again at the chat. We have received quite some questions and I'll go back a little bit to uh, uh, Michelle uh, just with a very quick last question I see from the chat. So somebody is asking uh, for agricultural purposes, uh, which is going to be the limits. Now we know that reuse water regulation is looking at the application uh, at the um, uh, agricultural use. Um, and in fact, this is actually a natural link between the two of them. Uh, the, the reuse water regulation is clearly setting some, uh, um, clearly setting the, the limits and and um, and uh, and also the the timing. How we uh, do you think that the urban wastewater treatment directive, in light of what we saw also from a technical viewpoint, Will same the save uh, will can serve the same purpose on protecting uh, public health for what concerns bathing, drinking water, and the related uh, um, receiving waters. Michelle, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, yeah, I, I've heard half of the question, <laughs> so you will get oh. half of the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, my understanding is that, uh, you know, we have made a lot of efforts with this revision to ensure that there are uh, direct and clear connection between the water reuse regulation, the drinking water directive, the bathing water directive, uh, you know, with this directive. So in several instances, in several articles, this connection are made, but also with the water framework directive as well, you know, that's clear. So we, we pay attention to ensure a coherence between all these texts. Uh, on water reuse, we have in, even include the possibility of derogation of uh, tertiary treatment, so from nitrogen and phosphorus, where there is water reuse in agriculture. While well, there are uh, severe conditions to do that because it's a derogation of an existing requirements, but we were thinking, okay, we should leave a possibility of innovation and a possibility of using this uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in the wastewater directly in the fields, as long as uh, the crops can absorb it and that they are not or that the leakages are uh, limited so there is a, also a kind of incentive for water reuse uh, through this derogation for tertiary treatment but overall we have tried to make the connection with all the existing legislation and all the objective of uh, the existing legislation and the urban wastewater treatment directive but make it uh, really concrete so i hope that i have answered to your half question <laughs> Thank you and I apologize and thank you for completing uh, the rest of the question uh, there. Um, there is many other questions for you, uh, Michelle, in the chat. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have all the time. We are a little bit, uh, um, yeah, going running behind the time. So 
I will go back to you with uh, some other questions via mail and um, and follow that to the to the to the colleagues and the, the people who have asked them. I have a further question for Nuno. I'm there still. Can you yes, still hear me? Great. Yes. Uh, Nuno, as a member of Water Europe. Uh, we are all aiming to build a water smart society and are dedicated to fostering water security, sustainability and resilience. And we saw that from the work that you are doing at EDP. What support would you need from the Commission to make sure those objectives are achieved in the context of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive? Well, uh, from, from our concept, the, um, the smart uh, water uh, society um, need to have, uh, uh, among other things, uh, a full uh, circulation of information. And uh, this is very important. We need to engage our citizens in this common mission that we have all together to uh, keep our water resources in a, a good health. So I, uh, I, I, I would like to emphasize that we need to um, share with our citizens um, what we are doing in our sector, what are the advantages of this kind of, um, of uh, approach that we are doing now, a more holistic approach. And at the end of the, the day, the common citizen needs to feel that he's paying for something else, uh, that he's paying for uh, protect their, their health, protect the ecosystems and so on. So telling this, I think that the um, European Commission has an important uh, role to um, use the information that will come from these uh, risk assessments and increasing monitoring uh, conditions to um, share the data and information with the, with the common citizens. I think that this is very important to create a more smart and a more wise society in terms of um, water uh, culture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nuno. So um, I would like to take again the opportunity to thank uh, the European Commission, Michel Spunar as a representative for the great work and for the, you know, for the amazing improvement that has been uh, done over uh, the last revision. Let's not forget that we started from 1991 with the old directive of 30 years. The, 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 the request that the revised directive, it is uh, bringing up a number of novelties again more uh, towards, uh, uh, let's say, uh, bringing more um, public health uh, uh, certitude and security. Uh, a number of other elements that were not in the scope of today's discussion as well. So thank you again on behalf of everyone for the great job uh, that you are doing, uh, Michelle and your colleagues. I would like to thank uh, as well uh, all the participants who stayed with us all the way uh, and despite the, the initial difficulties. Um, I would uh, just uh, add a couple of words in, in, in concluding uh, and saying that thank you to the speakers as well. And we understand that there is a number uh, of uh, work, there is still work to do. So this new directive is um, an amazing proposal and it is providing a good uh, set, let's say, a pathway for all the stakeholders to work together. Michelle mentioned that there is going to be work at a member state level. We hope that uh, you will bring back uh, the messages from this, uh, um, th the request from the stakeholders we're receiving that more uh, clarity is needed. Uh, the users will need to find a way to uh, make sure that the resources are there as well, uh, so that there is uh, the, the, the information to the public they have to know that uh, they, there is one water and that it is well taken care of, that we are monitoring properly and that we are making sure that water for uh, the kinds of usages, it is uh, safe for that specific usage as well. With that, I would like to thank the, uh, the entire team behind, on the background and, uh, and talk to you and see you next time. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.